it serves to engage world leaders uh, in academia, in practitioners, uh, in government agencies, uh, to engage them to interact with MSU, and then actually it's MSU and the broader community. Um, and it's basically the intention is through this venue, uh, we're going to provide a interface between MSU and global leaders in cutting edge environmental. Uh, today, we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Nathan Phillips from Boston University. Uh, Dr. Phillips um, uh, is a professor in the Department of Earth and Environment at Boston University. And over the years, he served as the director of undergraduate programs, director of graduate programs, and associate chair in the Department of Earth and Environment at BU. Uh, and also, he served as the director for Center for Energy and Environmental Studies. Um, during 2013 and 2014, uh, Dr. Phillips took a leave from BU and uh, served as a fellow of the California Council on Science and Technology uh, with a placement in the California Senate uh, Transportation Council. Um, he is very prolific, uh, his publication record is very impressive, and his research interests uh, really is wide and, and diverse, uh, spanning from carbon and water balances of forest ecosystems, to the study of urban ecology in cities, and to the much broader and integrated interests in the ecology of cities. Uh, so today, um, uh, he's going to talk about towards safe and efficient infrastructure, lessons from Potter Ranch uh, to Boston. Uh, Dr. Phillips. Thank you so much for the kind introduction to the Thank you for coming out. Um, and it's, it's a really, uh, it's an honor to be here to uh, to present to you. And so, so I'd like to start off. Um, with a picture of a tree because it helps me remind myself and just kind of start by saying at some level talking about infrastructure um, is you know I'm, I'm a little bit of an imposter here I'm a tree physiologist um, I study uh, terrestrial ecosystems uh, Ji Quan Chen here knows me we know each other from many years ago working in forest ecosystems and, and thinking about and measuring carbon and water fluxes um, but I realized that um, there's a skill set that came along with being an ecologist and a tree physiologist that by chance allowed me to learn something about our cities and how they run and infrastructure problems. And it's led me on a pretty, uh, just a very amazing research journey. And I want to share that story with you. And it started with trees. This is a, a baobab tree in Tanzania, but closer to home, outside in the outskirts of uh, the suburbs of Boston, where I live, the town of Newton, uh, I got hooked on infrastructure uh, through a tree. Okay, and I was walking literally two blocks from my house and met a person who was measuring gas leaks. And this person was using something that looked like a metal detector or something that you see from the Ghostbusters film. Uh, and this person, his name is Bob Ackley, was measuring gas leaks around a tree. So I went and asked this uh, person, who turned out to be a 30-year veteran of the gas industry, what are you doing with this device? And he said, these gas leaks kill trees. And that hooked me. This was about five or six years ago. I wanted to know, how does it kill a tree? What's going on here? What's the soil environment? Um, and then it became this wormhole into a whole set of other issues that I never ever dreamed I would uh, be studying, like uh, the natural gas infrastructure system. Even the fact that as a combustible gas, natural gas can explode the methane in it um, and, and have those kinds of urban issues. And so I want to share a little bit with you that, that story. And I also want to uh, share with you how the tree has become a sort of lens for me to think about uh, the systems, the physical systems and the physical infrastructure that undergird our cities. 
and how we can think about you know uh, a tree as maybe a gold standard for sustainability and, and what are some of the things we can learn from there and and so you might think of this a little bit as a talk about uh, what you might call urban biomimicry okay and at the at the city scale and so actually I'm not the only one by any means who's looking at this so people are looking at a structure of networks for delivery of resources this looks a lot like a city street grid right um, but how do leaves distribute uh, uh, materials and resources what happens if there's a break in the network is there redundancy is there resilience how if, how is the efficiency balanced with resilience so some very uh, exciting areas there and even more recently you might have heard of uh, this uh, it's come to be called the, the, uh, the World Wood Wide Web, I think, or something like that. But the below ground network um, of communication that is occurring and sharing of resource, resources in the below ground environment in, in forests that's just really quite amazing. So we're really learning a lot about uh, these kinds of uh, biological systems that I think we can, we can learn lessons of for uh, our, our urban infrastructure. And so, as a graduate student, when I was studying tree physiology, one of the first things I learned about were trade-offs. Ecology is replete with trade-offs. Do one thing really well, you're gonna maybe not do something else uh, as well. And one of the key trade-offs in plants and trees is the trade-off for efficiency and resilience. Okay? So the more and more you get efficient about doing something, the, the less and less resilient that system may be. And so I study the vascular system of trees, the, water, the pipes that move water up from the roots to the leaves and that transport carbon down into the, uh, in the other direction. And you do see this, this kind of trade-off. And so trees have evolved some marvelous ways to negotiate that trade-off and to find some kind of uh, sweet spot that's in between uh, those two areas. And so here's, a, here's an example of, of an oak tree. And, and to me, among the trees, oaks are some of the, the most uh, wise, you could say, in terms of having evolved this balance. Okay? Um, and so what they can do, is, what they do do, this is, this is several years of uh, annual rings in an oak tree. And these are all the pipes that are, that are moving water through the system. And so these are very efficient pipes at moving water. Uh, these ones are very inefficient. So why would a tree build these inefficient pipes? Well, they're safe. Those big pipes uh, are prone to failure especially when freezing conditions happen, they can basically embolize uh, or cavitate, become gas-filled, and then it's, it's really bad. It's like having an aneurysm or something in a human body. It cuts off the, the flow. Um, if you double the size of a pipe, you increase the flow rate by a factor of 16. That's how sensitive this flow is, the efficiency. Um, but oaks have this system where they, they kind of have it all. They have the efficient system, but they've also built in this much more resistant to failure backup uh, system. And so these are the kinds of things that I think about when I start to think about um, you know, urban infrastructure. And so as we started to learn about this problem in, in Boston area with, with gas leaks, um, and we started to map out uh, with a very high precision methane analyzer, methane being the largest constituent of, of natural gas, we started to think of this as kind of a, a problem of what we call urban metabolism. Okay, So that metaphor of a biological system, we had been funded by the National Science Foundation on a project that we called urban metabolism. And we happened to have the analyzers that could measure CO2 uh, uh, and its spatial extent in the city. And methane, methane was actually a byproduct. We never intended to measure it, but we started picking this up after, after I had become aware that there's this problem. Um, and from measuring uh, you know, 
finding that these leaks were prominent, uh, we then got a little bit more funding and, and we were able to get funding to map the entire city of Boston, all of the streets in the city, and to map out and find where these uh, gas leaks are. So this is a problem of infrastructure. Um, there's 3,000, we found 3,356 uh, individual gas leaks. That's what the porcupine figure looks like there. The red is the streets that we drove uh, there. And methane is growing like uh, carbon dioxide since the Industrial Revolution. In fact, it's growing even faster. Uh, uh, and the background now, the average global background is a little under two parts per million. And you can just see some of those spikes that are exceeding many multiples of times the background value that's already been elevated. Um, so what's the problem with this? And it's not, it's not a great mystery. We have old infrastructure. Here's uh, an old cast iron pipe that's many decades of years, uh, many decades old. Uh, and in this particular case, this was actually punctured uh, by a gas worker who didn't know where the actual pipe was. So th this is hidden infrastructure, and even the experts don't necessarily know exactly where this stuff is. That puncture in that pipe led to an explosion um, in the town of Springfield, Massachusetts, that came out, that happened about three days after our paper was published in Boston. So it actually led to a lot of questions um, from, from the media on whether you know, there was an explosion risk in, in Boston. Um, and, and so here's what this, here's just a snippet of what this infrastructure looks like in, in Boston. So uh, this is just a little bit of, this is the north end of Boston. Here's the kind of downtown financial district area and neighborhood called Back Bay. And this, I'm just showing you, here's 10 inch diameter. This is what's under the streets, cast iron very old, uh, low pressure, 1882. Here's one that's 1857. This is the age at which those pipes were put in, okay? So, so East Coast cities uh, along the entire Eastern Seaboard really um, are, have this really aging infrastructure problem, um, you know, and, and we thought of it as, as kind of a, in the context of urban metabolism, uh, a kind of urban metabolic disorder. And so, how do we start to, uh, to, to, to quantify you know, this problem? Um, well, the, the gas companies in every state, including Michigan, have to report to the federal government uh, how much gas is unaccounted for, lost and unaccounted for, okay? And I just wanna, this is a very busy table here, but I just wanna indicate to you how little we know about this problem, okay? Um, these uh, are the numbers reported to the uh, Energy Information Administration. Um, and in the state of Mass Commonwealth of Massachusetts, for example, in the year 2005, there, this is 5 billion, 434 million, 5.4 billion cubic feet of gas that's lost and unaccounted for. That probably doesn't mean anything to you, um, but that's, that's a few percent of the amount of gas that's delivered to the entire commonwealth for that year. And it switches around in 2009, 12.9 billion cubic feet. And if you look at all the states and the years, it's like a shotgun. Uh, there's no rhyme or reason. Things don't, things don't go consistently by year. You get a big number like this for Illinois, and a number like this for Indiana, it's a lot different. It's even got a negative sign. What's a negative sign mean? Here's a negative sign. That means that apparently more, th what this is, it's the difference between what's go going into the system, the distribution system for natural gas, and the sum total of all the end use meters. So if you get a negative sign, it indicates that apparently more was consumed than was ever put into the system, okay? This is how little we really have a handle on the problem of, of lost and unaccounted for natural gas. So there's, there's three things that could be driving this. One is gas leaks. Another is the meters may be biased or wrong. Um, the meters may be running fast in all the homes, okay? Uh, and so that creates an error. Uh, and then there may be accounting 
errors uh, when the, the gas is all added up by, by quarters. So the next step for us was to try to estimate, well, how much of this loss in unaccounted for gas is due to leaks? Um, you know, that we measured thousands of these leaks, but, you know, we can count that number, that's 3,000 and so leaks, but how much does it actually lead to in terms of greenhouse gas, in terms of the commodity, the commodity itself, you know, what's the volume of, of lost gas? And so what we did next was to work with uh, collaborators at Harvard University, Steve Wofsey, um, uh, collaborators from Duke University, um, to set up a network of very high sites in which we are measuring methane. Same kind of precision analyzers that we used. But instead of trying to go, you know, leak by leak on the ground, we used the integrating power of the atmosphere itself as kind of a bathtub into which all of these thousands of leaks in Boston and the tens of thousands of leaks in eastern Massachusetts were building up into the atmosphere. And so we were, for example, on the top of uh, our five-story building at Boston University, uh, and we were in um, other places. We had a site out in Harvard Forest, central Massachusetts. The predominant winds go this way, um, and that gave us a clean background signal um, as the winds would come from the west to the east. So we knew that, that was always lower, and the readings in these other places were always higher, um, and that allowed us to basically use what's called inverse modeling of the atmosphere uh, to estimate how much was building up into the atmosphere. So there's our uh, our setup on the top of the t one of the two tallest buildings in Boston called the Prudential Center. Uh, so we were measuring off all four corners of that building uh, every second, 24 hours a day for an entire year. Um, and that allowed us to make an estimate of how much lost on kind of poor gas limits. And the number might not be stunning, um, it does add up uh, to, um, you know, over over decades a lot. Um, and, and this is, well actually no, not over decades, this uh, was a federal estimate for the annual total loss in the United States, so one and a half billion dollars left lost to gas line leaks. In the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we estimated 90 million dollars a year, and about a little under 3% of the uh, total amount of natural gas consumed was leaked into the atmosphere. That was the estimate that we made based on our measurements in, up in the, uh, these tower, towers and buildings. Okay? So 3%, that doesn't sound like a whole lot maybe, but the problem is that methane is like carbon dioxide on steroids as a greenhouse gas. Um, so depending on the time frame that you consider its effect, if you consider its effect over a 100-year time frame, it's about 34 times as powerful on a mass per mass basis as CO2 is. Okay? If you think about it on a 20-year time scale, it's over 80 times as powerful as a, of a greenhouse gas on, a, on a, a mass per mass basis. That's because the lifetime of methane is about 12 years. So if you think of its effect over 100 years, it gets diluted out. Even over that time period, it's a very powerful greenhouse gas. So what that means is that if we had a 3% leak rate um, coming out of all of these pipes throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, that magnifying effect of greenhouse gas uh, power leads to an estimate of about 10% of the Commonwealth's entire greenhouse gas inventory from all sources. Transportation, um, buildings, uh, you know, all of that, um, heating, home heating, electricity, um, the entirety of it. So it's, it's, a, it's a big, uh, you know, uh, potential impact. Um, and, you know, this is what we're, we're seeing with, with methane um, increasing due to not just gas leaks or natural gas systems, but all of the human activities that are generating uh, methane. So a big change in our global environment. And really, the after CO2, methane being the second biggest anthropogenic change in greenhouse gas warming uh, on the planet. So coming back to the idea, the, the concept here of you know, 
our infrastructure and how efficient is it? Well, this is, oops, oh, I'm sorry. That's why I never um, criticize students for uh, <laughs> having that happen. Um, that's an inefficiency, okay? That's, that's $90 million in just lost gas. Um, you know, and, and, and moreover, uh, a report on the natural gas infrastructure in New England, you know, it, it, it's worse because, you know, it's both inefficient in, in having these leaks. Oops. Now I'm on auto forward. Uh, but it's, it's recognized even by the, you know, the, the industry experts that little redundancy or interconnectivity in the pipeline system make it particularly vulnerable should any component fail, okay? So this system, like most of our systems uh, <coughs> delivering resources, follows a very traditional centralized, vertically integrated model where the commodity is, is mined in one location or a few uh, production areas, moved over very big pipes, um, and then distributed out into you know, the uh, city areas. And, and so you have a, a, a failure like we saw with you know, failure by a, a, a thousand you know, cuts, you could say, with all of these gas leaks, which, which really necessitates um, the big investor-owned utilities that manage these systems to have to react, and they've been very slow to address and even acknowledge this problem. Um, but now switching you know, from Boston to a, an entirely different place with, uh, in some ways, similarities, in some ways, difference, differences. Um, I want to uh, share with you uh, what we did just in the early part of this year when we went to what's been referred to uh, perhaps in a gender biased way as the mother of all gas leaks, maybe the father of all gas leaks, whatever you want to call it. Um, and if I can find my uh, Google Maps, which I yeah, think somewhere. In October of last year, um, there was a, a big problem that emerged up in uh, the LA area. Okay? October 23rd, people in this community of Porter Ranch started smelling something. And it was this um, odorant that's put into natural gas. Because uh, natural gas is odorless. Methane is odorless. So they put in odorant to it. And here in this community of Porter Ranch, people were starting to complain about this odor. They had no idea uh, what was right back behind them. It's a very charming um, and, and kind of manicured uh, community of, of several thousand people here in this Porter Ranch uh, area. Sorry, that it's not so visible to see, but you can see the, the basic outlines there, right up against this mountainous area here. Um, and What's behind there is a massive storage field of natural gas. Okay? 86 billion cubic feet of natural gas is stored in these hills, just like uh, a quarter or a half mile from the neighborhood. Right here. Okay, so this is the San Fernando Valley. Uh, so part of the big LA kind of basin, but kind of separated from LA proper by the um, Hollywood Hills and that kind of thing. Um, and then here's part of the, called the Santa Susana Mountains, which kind of form part of the ring um, that forms the LA Basin. Um, and, and so you can maybe kind of see here, it, there's this pin cushion view. If you go on to a uh, satellite view, you can just see all of those wells there. And the people that live there never really knew uh, anything about this. Let's see if we can take a look on satellite view. So what had happened there is a similar story of aging infrastructure, okay? But in this case, it was 86 billion cubic feet of, uh, of, of storage gas, and a single pipe that failed um, from 8,000 and some feet below uh, the surface um, 
from the well and spewing uh, at 2,700 pounds per square inch. For, I, I should have come up with the SI unit for that. It's high pressure, very, very high pressure. Okay? Um, and, and it's old infrastructure. It was a 1953 uh, well. It was about two and a half inches in diameter, something like that, surrounded by a seven inch diameter uh, metal casing. Okay? And then should have been surrounded all the way through by uh, concrete, cement, okay? but wasn't. All right? uh, it comes to, find out, come to find out, and they still have not released findings as to how this actually happened, but it happened and it spewed tremendous amounts of natural gas. Last month, or maybe the month before, it was finally capped. It spewed for four months uh, natural gas. Um, the equivalent of, I think it was about 100,000 kilograms, or 1,000 uh, uh, metric tons of, 100,000 metric tons of methane into the atmosphere. Um, and that basically was equivalent to about one quarter of the entire state of California's methane emissions, that one, one leaking well. Uh, that, led, that was equivalent to about uh, two million motor vehicles, gasoline motor vehicles, being driven for an entire year, or about um, three quarters of a million homes, in terms of the equivalent greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, coming from this. So a really, really uh, negative uh, impact there. Uh, but here again, we're talking about aging old infrastructure, and infrastructure in which uh, the entire Southern California area has become very dependent on, okay? And so when this event happened, uh, everyone had to evacuate. People have, still haven't moved back because in fact, another leak has recently come up and, and people are now very wary of any smells that are associated with natural gas. Um, but it's very instructive to think about where do we go from here and the perceptions um, and, and the policy prescriptions that are coming out in the wake of this uh, disaster. So some, uh, the, the residents in Port Ranch, they're saying shut it down permanently. This thing does not belong here. We need to transition our energy system to a cleaner system. Um, and what you're seeing um, from Southern California Gas, on the other hand, uh, is basically a statement that you just can't do that. We are dependent on natural gas. You cannot just pull the plug on this thing. It's not going to, to work. You got to, and, and so right now it's being battled as to what in, in the California legislature and with the Public Utilities Commission as to whether they can actually get off of this uh, or not. And so the Southern California Gas Company has now come out and said, if this is not started back up again, this Aliso Canyon right behind Port Ranch, that Southern California can expect about 14 blackouts uh, this summer, okay? Uh, now, this is very contentious as well, uh, so just, uh, oh, back to here. Um, so if you just Google, um, you know, Porter Ranch and, and Blackout, uh, you'll see all of these. It's being, you know, basically debated whether or not uh, the utility, Southern California Gas, and Sempra, the parent corporation, are essentially using this as a scare tactic um, to, to retain um, the systems that they have invested so much in you know, into uh, and to, to actually get it back uh, and ramped up to where it actually was. So this is an example, I think, in which we really start to see the crossroads that we're at when we think about our infrastructure. Do we go back and make the systems, you know, build and further invest, double down in these, or how do we actually make the transition um, off of these kinds of, of 
uh, systems. Um, I want to just show you uh, what we did in Porter Ranch for a second um, here. So no one at the time, we went out, we, we actually did a road trip uh, from Boston out to Porter Ranch because we wanted to see uh, for ourselves what is the condition of methane on the streets and sidewalks of this uh, neighborhood. No one had actually measured that. They had, there was lots of stuff happening at the point of the leak, flights going over, people using infrared uh, video cameras to look at the plume coming out. But in terms of what people were breathing in their homes, on the streets and the sidewalks, um, and so this is the routes that we took, uh, and this is all Porter Ranch here, and you can see the big plumes there, the, you can't see the top of that, but we would get sustained uh, values of methane that were exceeding 40 parts per million, so more than 20 times the background value, and then intermittently up to 150 parts per million. Um, the, the thing that's, you know, the direct effects of methane uh, to breathe in, it's not really known, and, and those values aren't going to be like explosive values in the air or anything like that. You need to have percent level methane. But the question is, what else is in that gas? Okay? This is coming from a storage facility that was an old uh, petroleum reserve. It was an oil reserve that was pumped dry and that was turned into a storage facility for gas. So there's a lot of those uh, compounds, those hydrocarbon compounds that are still in there, like and, and some of the nasty ones like benzene, toluene, xylene, that are associated with the methane gas. So we didn't ourselves measure all of those things, but you know um, there's some real concern about um, the air the, the air quality uh, in, in that area. So the, the the state leaders in California have said, you know, never again. This is never going to happen again. But really, if you think that they don't even know why this happened yet, okay? They think that it may have something to do with the fact that uh, I, I mentioned there's the concentric pipes. There's the two and a half inch diameter main pipe, and it's surrounded by a seven inch diameter casing pipe, and then the concrete. What Southern California Gas has been doing as a matter of general practice, it, it's, it, it was supposed to be that you only use the inner annulus to inject for storage or to draw out for, you know, when you need it. They've been using both the inner and the outer because it's just much more efficient to move the gas. And the speculation is, even though they haven't released the results, that in doing that, um, and especially if you have, we're talking 2,700 pounds per square inch, if you have these kind of annulus and you don't have good concrete holding it, you can really start to have some mechanical problems that might have been the, the cause of that failure. Okay? All right. I wanted to just make one other point too, which gets back to the view that I've had, the perspective as a tree physiologist and, and as an ecologist, okay? And this is back in Boston now. And, and there's a, what we learned is, is that, you know, our infrastructure is co-located and it's interdependent. If you think about our road networks, the water lines are under there, the sewer lines are under there, the gas lines are under there, the electric, electrical lines are either above or maybe below. And it's like an ecosystem. In fact, you can call it an infrastructure ecosystem. Or it's like an organism. I mean, we have a skeletal system, we have our nervous system, we have our cardiopulmonary system, right? They're co-located. And in our bodies, if th these systems talk to each other, right? If you get frightened, your, your nervous system communicates with your cardiopulmonary system, and, and you know these systems talk, OK? What we found in, in Boston, and this is pretty much the, the uh, business status quo is disconnect, failure to connect the dots, um, siloed infrastructure maintenance and management. And so what we would find um, are lots of missed opportunities 
um, we find things like um, a tree that had, been, that had been killed by a gas leak and a patch of the gas leak comes too late to save the tree. Okay? Um, this is in the neighborhood of Roslindale, in, in one of the neighborhoods of Boston. Um, let me see if I can show you this little video here, or maybe not. Um, well, I'll just explain it to you. We're measuring gas in the soil, and this is a brand new sapling, I, you know, several hundred dollars, that has just been planted into an active gas leak. Okay, because the city uh, parks department, they don't know what the, you know, the utility knows or even doesn't know about gas leaks, okay, and where they are. Um, and so lots and lots of missed opportunities. Um, uh, here's another neighborhood in Boston. This is the Char uh, Charlestown neighborhood in Boston. Here's Main Street in, in Charlestown. There's a big leak here, the spike there. Um, and, and we were out there, uh, Bob Ackley, the person who I met uh, near you, there's uh, collaborator Rob Jackson. Um, and this, even though it's raining here, you might see, this is brand new pavement, okay? Brand new road pavement over many decades old leaking gas pipes. Um, there used to be trees uh, in these tree wells along this street. You can see someone actually even tried to put in and plant a new little, uh, conifer tree, uh, and that didn't last very long at all, okay? So lots of missed opportunities, uh, but it's something that indicates to us how much opportunity there is to think about um, coordinated infrastructure management. We can do so much better with our cities. You know, we, we talk about smart cities, you might have heard that term, smart cities, but sometimes being smart can actually be unwise, okay? So the gas company could sometimes be very diligent about patching their, their leaks, but if they're not coordinated with the Department of Road Paving or Department of Public Works, they might actually make the overall situation worse because when you make these patches, you're basically seeding potholes. Okay, so, so basically, I, I think, you know, uh, SMART can be unwise when it doesn't uh, have context. In, in space or in time or in system, you know, uh, uh, context. Uh, and that's one very important thing we've learned from the work in Boston, and I think a thing that we can really, uh, you know, uh, benefit from uh, going forward. Uh, it's uh, 4.15, so I'm going to try to just uh, wrap up here uh, and, and, and share with you in a kind of a rapid fashion one other story. Um, about the resilience and efficiency trade-off, and that it's also from Boston. Um, you know, here you are close to something that's hit the national news in a big way: uh, the Flint water crisis, and that's about infrastructure, and that's about management or mismanagement, and and decisions that were made, or bad decisions that were made, or lack of decisions. And I don't presume to have um, to be able to share something that maybe you thought even more about since it's kind of in, in your area. But I'd love to hear from you, um, you know, and I want to share the story from Boston that relates to water. It's a different kind of story, um, but it, it's been very instructive for us. And so on, this is one of the little sub-projects that we did from our NSF um, urban metabolism project, and it was about water system resilience. And something happened on May 1st, 2010. Um, it, was, it came to be called Aquapocalypse in Boston. Um, and so I just want to quickly uh, run through what, what happened here um, and, and talk about that infrastructural system. And so here's the Greater Boston Municipal Water Supply. We've actually hy hydrologically kind of bypassed Boston, like many cities do. We rely on this big reservoir in central Massachusetts called the Boston Reservoir. And really, one big giant pipe that feeds 2.2 million people in this greater Boston um, service area, okay? Um, and that single pipe failed on May 1st, 2010, okay? Um, the, the funny thing, uh, yeah, so uh, it, what's really funny in a way is that I actually, this leak 
it, I, where I live, we're the second closest home to where that leak occurred. <laughs> and, and so, and even, even more funny in a way than that is I lectured on this to my freshman class at BU the week before this leak actually emerged. I mean, about the issue, I obviously couldn't get about this particular issue. Um, uh, but this is where it happened. Um, and, and there was a sequence of events that occurred uh, after that happened within a few hours of basically 2.2 million people being without instantly being told through emergency alerts, you can't drink your water anymore, okay? Um, because there's a break uh, in, in, in the water. And then a boil water it, uh, order was issued. So they did have some level of backup pipes, but those backup pipes uh, went, basically had to use ponds as kind of buffering capacity. And, you know, they couldn't be sure how clean the water was, so they had to do a boil water order there. Um, uh, so, so here's from the Boston Globe. Just, you know, the, the pipe was only seven years old in this case. Uh, about a three meter diameter uh, pipe running eight million gallons uh, uh, per uh, hour of, of water. Um, so, so it's actually this section right here, and literally our house is just right on the other side of the Charles River there. Okay, um, here's what the pipe looked like, and there's a human there for uh, scale, so eight million gallons per hour. And this, this what, what they know is this thing came, un, this coupling came undone. For whatever reason, they don't know how, how that happened, um, and so instantly, eight million gallons per hour uh, was lost. Okay. Um, this is what it looked like. Um, it, there's a Charles River going in this direction, and the breach was up there. The Charles River has about eight million gallons per hour of flow, so it was like doubling the flow of the Charles River. You had like a new river uh, feeding into this. Um, Charles River uh, just instantaneously. And so basically, you know, from May 1st uh, to May 4th, it was only about 72 hours, really, in which we had this crisis in Boston. Um, and, you know, how did we deal with that? Well, at some level, we did pretty well. Um, the boil water went, order went out, the state of emergency was declared the next day, the National Guard came in. Okay, um, the leak was fixed it, it, 72 hours later and the boil water order was lifted. Um, and these final things that happened and they still don't know why it failed, okay? But when we think about resilience, you know, my reflection on this was, you know, is, is this really a demonstration of, of resilience? And, and maybe we can talk about that at, at the end. Um, just, you know, some of the observations since we were there, we were under the boil water order ourselves. Um, uh, here's some of the things that, so there, it was a run on the water. Okay. People didn't want to boil the water. They just wanted to get bottled water. They thought like, ooh, I have to boil the water. I, I think the psychology was if I have to boil it, it's probably not good to drink anyway, even if I boil it. Um, so you had this uh, run on the water. Um, and this is a kind of a, uh, a typical response that you see, um, you know, same type of thing that happened in, in, in uh, Tokyo in the aftermath of, of Fukushima. So just some lessons on resilience and how we deal with a situation like that. And, and our utter dependency on these, you know, a single pipe, okay, um, which is very efficient in moving water, okay. If you had two pipes, of half the diameter, okay, you had some redundancy, but the flow rate would be much less. Just going back to like the tree example that I showed you. Um, so the managers of the water system, basically, you know, when they think about resilience, um, you know, they're basically, their mindset is, and their business uh, model is less about building resilience than it is to um, increase the number of communities that are buying into their the, the water system. And so in their own internal reports, this is the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, 
They define resilience as the ability of the water supply to recover from an unsatisfactory uh, condition. And, and to get a little more specific, they only define resilience as the level of that reservoir, okay, the Quabbin reservoir. It has nothing to do with the intrinsic properties of the pipe network that um, they have. And so we have some work to do uh, in terms of thinking about, you know, these centralized, vertically integrated infrastructure systems, how they operate, and the vulnerabilities that are engendered when the focus is uh, primarily on efficiency. Oops. Um, so just a little um, way of thinking about this, you know, this is a very generalized schematic of this centralized, vertical, integrated um, you know, type of system where you have one big reservoir, like an aqua reservoir, and it basically goes out um, unidirectionally ultimately to our homes where we basically utilize you know, this, this, this commodity. Um, but by building in, by starting to build in uh, some resilience, meaning uh, generation, uh, harvesting of water at local scales, okay, we need basically some elements of scale, what I call scale diversity, uh, because so many of our systems are pretty much almost 100% reliant on distant delivery of, of services. So this is my schematic um, to show how um, we can really start to change the nature of our grids to start to make them bi-directional in some cases instead of just the standard unidirectional um, you know, dependency grids that we, we have. Um, and th you know, there's good examples from other places in, 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 in the world, like for example in Bangalore, where uh, they are mandating rainwater collection um, at the building scale in Bangalore to provide some level of uh, complement or supplement to the main municipal water supply. Okay? And so it's an example of infrastructure that is moving to a more distributed model, even with regard to water. We hear a lot about uh, solar energy and distributed uh, solar, right? Uh, but this concept is general to our food supply system, our water supply system, even our gas supply system. Um, there are ways in which we can, we can wean ourselves from that almost 100% dependency on, on distant <coughs> sources. Actually in Boston, it used to be that way. Here's the Boston Water and Sewer Commission website. Did you know that before 1795, Boston residents obtained their water from local wells, rain barrels, and a spring on the Boston Common? So in fact, we have, through the industrial age, increasingly built these uh, highly centralized systems when we actually, you know, in, in past years, uh, had some of that scale diversity. Maybe we were too much on the local scale then, um, and, and really we do need the big scales. Flying here from Detroit and I saw the big, you know, farm fields. We need all scales. We have to have big scales for food production but let's not make it, you know, 99.9% dependent on those scales. Same goes for wind and solar. We do need big offshore wind, um, but we need small solar farms, community solar farms, and rooftop solar has a role as well. So it crosses um, all of these different uh, domains of, of the different resources that we use. Here's our little house, uh, you know, and I just, for, this is our, our modest little house in Newton, and I just outlined you know, how much water actually, how feasible is it for the water that falls on Greater Boston to supply us, in principle, with the water that we consume, okay? Uh, how much could come off of that rooftop? Um, maybe not for drinking, but for maybe feeding the garden. Um, and it turns out Boston's really in a pretty good situation because we're, our rainfall is distributed throughout the year pretty evenly, and about 30% of if you if you go in our own house uh, with the rooftop, if we were able to harvest that, that would that would give us 30% of our daily water usage. Okay, and in the city of Boston, about 30% of the water that's consumed uh, in magnitude is actually the same amount that's falling on Boston as rainfall. But we never we, we don't use probably 
one one hundredth of a percent of, of that rainfall. So there's a lot of opportunities for us to think about localizing to some degree um, you know, our, our resources. And so, so I just want to end with you know, thinking of that you know, very dependent centralized model and how we can start moving to a physical infrastructure um, that distributes um, and starts to balance, go back to that oak tree vasculature, we start to balance and have um, some efficiency and some resilience and, and it starts to um, really democratize um, our, our, our resource generation um, and sort of, and it's, it doesn't stop there, it goes to not just the physical infrastructure but what you can call the knowledge networks, okay, the sensors, um, that measure this stuff and how well we know about that. And ultimately, the people um, and the interface of human knowledge and human awareness and sharing of information um, between humans. And the work that we did in Boston, you know, if there's one thing that I can just end with, is that, you know, it really showed us that, that what's hidden and invisible it becomes a huge barrier to making, uh, you know, changes. So even in this room right now, you know, the built environment works against our ability to be aware of resources because it's all opaque, right? Everything's behind a wall, and the only thing we have is a button or a, a, a switch, and, and we don't really know. It's out of sight, out of mind. The problem with gas leaks had been known about for decades. It's just that no one, you and I didn't know about it. I didn't know about it until I stumbled onto this stuff. Okay? And so if we could you know, peel off the street and start to know more about these systems, um, I think that's, that, that's something that could really help us to, to build these uh, more resilient, more efficient infrastructure systems. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and uh, ask you for your questions and thoughts. Okay, so this is fantastic. Thank you very much. And uh, let's, let's open the floor for questions. <laughs> yeah, Nathan, that was uh, wonderful uh, thinking. Now, uh, uh, I want to check with the basic issues. Um, so, what is the lethal, lethal level for methane to get to the tree? Because in the two of your slides, uh, you point out trees are dead, but right next to 